Welcome to the fourth episode of our special five-part tribute to the Brian De Palma thriller. Tonight, we examine what many consider De Palma's masterpiece, Blowout, with special guests including author and critic John Kenneth Muir, actress Nancy Allen, and producer George Leto, with additional insights from legendary cinematographer Vilmos Zygmunt. Coming up next on Movie Geeks United. It began with a sound that no one was ever supposed to hear. He's the one who saw it? Yes, he says he pulled a girl out of the car. And I would like you to forget about her. Yeah, that's what I heard just before the tire blew out. You're right, it was a shot. He recorded a murder. They say it never happened. There are still loose ends. Witnesses. The girl, I've decided to terminate her. Terminate her. Terminate her. Welcome to the show tonight, everybody. It's good to have you here. My name is Jamie. And my name is Jerry, and welcome to the Blowout Fiesta. Well, let's blow it out, baby. Yeah, do it. Do it. <laughs> uh, great series of shows so far this week. Wednesday, last night, we had uh, almost, a, went on for almost two and a half hours. A lot of ground to cover with Dress to Kill, apparently. Yeah. So yeah. I mean, there was a lot. That was a lot last night, no doubt about it. But it was worth it. I mean, it was very insightful, and the interviews were just incredible. So. Yeah, absolutely. And to be honest, Blowout's my favorite De Palma film, as, as it is for a lot of people. You know, yeah. I hear that. You know, and critically, you you sense that too. Mm-hmm. I think critically, in hindsight, at the time though, yeah, it's like people. At the time, though, no. But now, like, oh, yeah, in hindsight, you're like, oh, yeah, that's his best film, you know, so. Well, the movie had some real cr- uh, critical champions mm-hmm. uh, upon its release. I mean, uh, among them, Roger Ebert. Mm-hmm. I mean, I have what Roger Ebert wrote here. He said, this movie is inhabited by a real cinematic intelligence. The audience isn't condescended to. Mm-hmm. In sequences like the one in which Travolta reconstructs a film and sound record, uh, sound record of the accident, we're challenged and stimulated. We share the excitement to figuring out how things develop and unfold, when so often the movies only need us as passive witnesses, mm-hmm. which is another um, uh, 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 allusion to what we've been discussing right. throughout the week, which is the active participation that the audience uh, feels when they watch a De Palma movie. Right. Mm-hmm. No, yeah. you're absolutely right. But with audiences, you know, we talked about some movies that need to be rediscovered in De Palma's resume. Uh, This has happened with Blowout. Um, Maybe maybe Tarantino has something to do with it, because I know that 
It's his favorite De Palma film. It's mm -hmm. one of his top three favorite films of all time, right. outside Rio Bravo and Taxi Driver. Um, and he talks this up a lot. And you know, and when he did Pulp Fiction, he talked up John Travolta and the fact mm -hmm. that he always wanted to work with him after Blowout. Right. Watching Blowout. Uh, so let me tell uh, tell you guys what Blowout is about. In Blowout, John Travolta plays Jack a sound man for grade Z slasher flicks who inadvertently records an accident one night while capturing nature sounds in a park. As he swivels his microphone towards the sound of a speeding car, we hear a tire blow out, or perhaps it's a gunshot. When the car swerves and sinks into a river bend, Jack runs in to help. He's unable to help the to save the male driver, but he is able to rescue the female passenger, who turns out to be a prostitute named Sally, played by Nancy Allen. The driver, as Jack and the media soon discover, is a governor and presidential hopeful. So with his expert ear, Jack scrutinizes the recorded sounds and matches them with images that just so happen to be taken by an amateur Zapruder type that was also present in the park that night. And this sequence is one of the best examples of uh, kind of a making of a film within a film that I, I think exists. There, in, co in combining sound and image, Jack discovers that there was indeed a gunshot, and the death of the governor was not an accident, but a political assassination. So Jack's curiosity and his paranoia get the better of him as he collaborates with Sally to try to get to the root of the conspiracy, which places both of them in increasing danger. Um, the politics are front and center in this movie. They're not they're not necessarily as subverted as they are in, in other De Palma films. Mm -hmm. um, and it, 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 the performances are just uniformly across the board excellent. I I agree with Chris when he said last night. I don't think John Travolta has ever been better than he was in Blood. No, that, this is his best performance. This is single handedly. I'd have to say his greatest role. Um, I. I would stand by that um, regardless. I do think it's his best performance um, with, any, you know, John Lithgow. And, but, no, this is Travolta's film. I mean, this is the thing that when we watch a Travolta movie these days, God, we wish he was making something like this. You know, we wish he could yeah. find a part like this and not old dogs or whatever. Um, so, and it, yeah, was also, it was also kind of like a first adult wasn't it? Wasn't it considered the first kind of adult movie? Uh, yeah, because you had. Let's see. Him. What did you have before? You had Carrie, obviously, a Grease, Saturday Night Fever, and what was was Urban Cowboy before or after this? I don't remember. I don't. I don't recall either. But no, this Blowout, was Blowout's Urban. 1981. Urban Cowboy might be 82. Mm. Okay, so yeah, this would be the first grown-up role for him. Yeah. Yeah. And he, I mean, he's he's great in it. And watching it again recently, like the opening, mm -hmm. uh, the opening right off the bat, he kind of uses well the the very opening, which is it starts. Uh, you're not acclimated to what exactly you're watching, so mm -hmm. you, you you just think it's part. It it is the movie, right? It, as the camera glides through, you know, it's kind of a sorority house. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, to, from room to room, and there's a mass killer and killing teens in the shower and that kind of thing. Um, and it turns out to be they're running one of their grade Z horror movies mm -hmm. that that and Jack is taking notes on what sounds are needed in the mix. Mm -hmm. uh, so so that that's a great opening for a film because yeah. it's not. It, it, it's misleading. <laughs> of course, that's, that's the perfect thing. It's a trap, you know. It's a great thing that De Palma does. He, you know, right. He and then it cuts. Those. And then it cuts to Travolta in his sound room, and he's labeling uh, the, the sound strips. You know, this is thunder. Mm -hmm. uh, different sound effects, and 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 he's got the news on, and so the news report sets up uh, the political climate the political right. situation in, in Philadelphia at that time. The big Liberty Bell celebration, mm -hmm. uh, a governor, he's rumored to be running for president. He might make an announcement soon. Um, and and then it goes to split screen, and the, 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 the television report is going on on the right side of the frame, and you mm -hmm. see Travolta in the background working on his sound cues, and you hear the sound cues that he's 
that he's playing and labeling. And it cuts to the governor uh, making a speech. It's very clever. Uh, when it cuts to the governor making a speech, the sound effect that Jack is playing is a gunshot. Right. Uh, and and there, there are just little touches like that throughout the movie that you don't necessarily notice upon first viewing. Right. Mm-hmm. But like every other De Palma movie, I mean, it keeps on paying off the more you watch it. Right. It, oh, without a doubt. Yeah. I mean, there are there there's a lot a lot of uh, exploring to do with this film, and uh, we do a lot of it with John in, in this uh, this interview here. John Kenneth Muir, who's been great. Mm-hmm. Uh, check out his blog, Reflections on Film and Television. Blogspot. Uh, for just a wealth of his great criticism, but uh, particularly for He's rerunning his De Palma criticism uh, in concert with the show every night. Uh, so if you want to hear further thoughts from John about what he thinks are, about Blowout and Carrie and Dress to Kill and Sisters and Raising Cain tomorrow night, uh, go to go to his blog there because it's, it's just phenomenal writing. Uh, you can also read about his books, johnkennethmuir.com. He's written about John Carpenter, who just turned us down for an interview, but it's a great book anyway. Uh <laughs> Toby Hooper, Wes Craven, uh, Kevin Smith, uh, horror movies of the 70s and 80s, just just uh, terrific titles to choose from. So go to his uh, website there to, to read all about his, his books. Here is John Kenneth Muir talking to us about Blowout. Well, well with, with Blowout, and, and Blowout is, is actually my, my favorite De Palma. I mean, if I had to go back and... Take one De Palma film with me to to an island. It would be blow, it would be blow out. And I I think that it, because I love the seventies paranoid thrillers. I love the All the President's right. Men and Parallax right. View. And I'm just obsessed with those. I, I and I I think this falls into into that category. Oh yeah. Um, I mean, there's the, the obvious parallels: Chappaquiddick and right. the JFK assassination. And mm-hmm. So so what what is he saying about the political state in, in Blowout? Well, I, I think what you're seeing is really De Palma cynicism about the um, about the American dream, about the American political landscape, uh, you know, post Reagan. You know that. Um, you know, it, it, just think about this: if Chappaquiddick hadn't occurred, if, if Ted Kennedy had won against uh, Richard Nixon in, in 1972, if there'd been no Chappaquiddick, the history of this country would be vastly different. You know, yeah. Ted Kennedy was was really. Um, scandalized by this. I mean, he lost all of his standing as sort of a, you know, an ethical, you know, believable human being and and um, you know, reasonable heir to the to President Kennedy and and his fallen brother. You know, um, you know, there might never have been a Reagan if uh, if if uh, Kennedy had been president, had become president in seventy two. But he, you know, he 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 was not. Or if he had become president. You know, even in 1980, if there, you know, Chappaquiddick was a thing that changed him, and, and, and you know, sort of the key to blow out what De Palma is saying here is that those moments where somebody really blows it <laughs> are sort of the, uh, you know, they, they they change history, and, and and he's going a step further than that, and he's saying that um, film is the sort of, you know, technique. That can make or break a person, um, you know, in the in the uh, age of uh, sound bites and uh, nightly news. You know, he, yeah. his movie shows in laborious detail, um, you know, how movies can lie, how documentary style footage can be faked, it can be concocted. You know, we watch in detail as John Travolta's character Jack. I mean, he creates a film strip of the film's the car accident using. You know the, these photographic elements, and you, you, we see him laboriously, you know, snapping frames one at a time, and then you know putting on a soundtrack, and we start to see the power of images to manipulate. And again, this isn't this isn't a small deal. And um, you know, all, every administration since Reagan has been very adept at managing visuals. You know, you put your president, you know, before the Statue of Liberty on the Fourth of July with fireworks over him, and it creates. A resonant image in your head. Mm. You create, you you land your president on an aircraft carrier uh, with a banner that says "Mission Accomplished." You create an image. You create you create the reality. People believe that. You you manipulate imagery to to sell your product, um, to sell your ideology. And, and blowout is very much about that. People who are very afraid that someone is going to get in and 
change things so they they you know they they eliminate that candidate uh, and then they have to eliminate the cover up <laughs> you know yeah but i mean yeah. i think it's very much about that and it's very much about a cynicism because again you know there's so many symbols uh you know of americana in there you know you got you, you, sally um nancy allen's character i mean she she's literally killed in front of a huge american flag mm-hmm. um mm-hmm. you know uh, it, the, you know it's it's uh it's a metaphor for everything that's going wrong in America. I mean, she, you know, she, she, she has a, you know, a sort of a checkered history, the character, but I mean, she's basically an innocent in all this. She's just an American citizen trying to get by, and we see that innocence murdered by um, someone trying to follow the path to power. You know, fire, fireworks are a cover for gunshots. You know, it's, you know, it's so many images of Americana here are subverted and shown to be covers for a secret agenda, you know, the Liberty Bell Jubilee, you know, that that covers, you know, stalking and killing her. You know, it's it's just very much, you know, his cynicism about what's happening in America post Reagan, I think, you know, right after that election of nineteen eighty. Also, and you bring this up in your review, um, people want to believe the, the the fantasy image that they're sold. They yeah. they want to close their eyes to the darker aspects because they don't, unlike the lead character, or like the lead character, they they don't want to hear too much. You know, they don't right. want that final scream. Right, right. No, I, I mean I think that's exactly true. I think we've picked again and again in our culture people. Uh, to lead us, who are, are able to most efficiently sell us the the product that we most desire. I mean, that's the secret to politics. Tell us what we want to hear. Um, you know, and, and and sometimes what we want to hear is we have to get our house in order, and that's good. Then that the person mm-hmm. who says let's get our house in order gets elected. It's not always bad, but it can it can really get bad. You know, like you know it, the, you know the the danger in the 2000 race you know bush versus gore i mean everyone was was focusing on gore sighing you know during debates and and and, and you know the idea there was to sort of minimize the differences between george bush and al gore you, you know you always heard everybody saying well there's not really any difference between um you know there's no yeah. You know they're the same and it's cuz we were we were peaceful and prosperous so carl rove and his people didn't want to say we're going to go in a completely different direction because things were pretty good. So, mm-hmm. so what happened? We 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 focused on minutia, like well, you know, Al Gore is a you know a nerd, and <laughs> you know talking about lock, <laughs> you know and he's talking about lock boxes, and you know, well, wow, wasn't he weird in that debate? You know, uh, you know what I'm saying? You know, so yeah. we, we we weren't really paying attention to the substance, you know, you know, and and, and as a result, we got what we got, you know. <laughs> right? And your you know. your take uh, your take on the on the slasher film element of it because he's he he works on as a sound editor on grade Z kind of right. slasher flicks in the film. Kill it. You're right. It's hers. And it's shit. Look, Jack, I didn't hide that girl for her scream. I hide that girl for her tits. Well, then what are you worried about with those tits? He's going to be watching the screen. Let's move on. But wait a minute. Wait a minute. Come on. Look, how many years have we worked together? Let's see. I met you on uh, Bloodbath, right? Yeah. And then we did Bloodbath 2. And then we did uh, Bad Day at Blood Beach. And then we did Bordello of Blood. And then, uh, well, that brings us up to date, Co-Ed Frenzy. By the way, I didn't tell you this, but uh, I'd like to think this is our finest film. Almost two years. Oh, God, two years. Five times in two years. What are we doing? You know, you know what I can't figure out? Mm. I can't figure out what a smart guy like you is still doing that shit for. Oh, come on. You do this shit. I do the sound. Oh, come no, on. you do the shit. Oh, is that yeah, right? Yeah, like that wind in the trees. It sounds like you're whistling in the crap. That's the library stuff. We used it a million times. That is the trouble. I have heard it a million times. Now, get something new. New wind. Yeah, got it. And what about that scream? We got to dub that. All right. You know any good screamers? I got a few ideas. Yeah, I bet you do. Yeah, yeah. 
Just worry about the screen, will you? Huh? You say that it's not necessarily a critique of the slasher genre. It it, it more speaks to how we don't want to be the, how we are diverted by those by those elements, the, the sex and the all right. of that, it, and don't see the right. real picture. Exactly, exactly. I mean, you know, I, I, I can make a, an argument for the artistic vali- validity of Friday the 13th very easily. You know, Halloween more so, which is a much better film, and it's a slasher mm-hmm. film. You, know, you, you, you can make a validity for the artistry and artistic merit of those films, but they don't come from, you know, tits and ass. They don't come from the violence. They come from, you know, what is the film really saying? What is it really about? But that's mm-hmm. not why That's not why all the slasher films are made. There are plenty of, of films, just like the one in the movie, grade the slasher films, which are just about, do the formula. Get it out quick. It'll make money in the first week and we'll, we'll be rich. You know, that, that you know, these, these, uh, some critics call them nice kill films or, or fast playoffs. You know, you, you need a a, a, a snappy title about a holiday. You need someone in a mask killing people, and you need lots of tits and ass. And and yeah. you know there there's that, that there is that cynicism. But but I mean you can look at, at Friday the Thirteenth and say no, it 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 it, it, uh, it 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 has artistic merit. Not like that. It's, it's like any form. You know, there's the best and there's the worst. And, and at the bottom is, is at its most cynical and formulaic and you know uh, most manipulative and at the top are the things where you know there's actually something going on in the story um, you know that's meaningful in the culture so I you know I don't want to paint slasher movies with just one brush uh, because I like slasher films you know I like good slasher films I like to say (laughs) if a slasher film's good I like it but um you know I don't like the bad ones you know the 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 bad ones are misogynist Uh, the bad ones are um, leering you know they're they're sort of uh, devoid of artistry and devoid of uh, of humanity, and I think that what De Palma is saying in Blowout is that you know it's that cynicism with America again. Now, now you know the movies that are being made are these sort of cynical cash grabs, uh, you know, devoid of uh, of characters, devoid of meaning, uh, you know, devoid of beauty, and filled with violence. And that's very different from his films because his films do have beauty. The violence mm-hmm. has meaning. Um, you know, the, the, the characters do stay with you, you know, for the most part, just like we were talking about with Carrie. Um, you, you know, so, you know, I, I think, it, it, again, it's like somebody who's sort of working at the top of the genre, looking down, saying, like, you know, not everybody is a John Carpenter. You know, not everybody is a, a Wes Craven. You know, there's also these mm-hmm. guys down here. And, but he's drawing the connection between that, between that emptiness and cynicism, with the emptiness and cynicism he sees in politics. See, that's what I think the connection is. Yeah, Does, yeah. does that make sense? It does make sense. It, okay. Yeah, perfect sense. And and with the with the characters, I, I wanted to discuss just quickly these two lead characters and blow out. Um, the, starting with with Nancy Allen's character, uh, the prostitute, which right. which which might come off as just that the, the prostitute in any other right. film. Uh, how, how does he distinguish that character? What's well, unique about her? Well, what you uh, you know, and, and you know, you could say this is a cliche, but I mean, she really is the prostitute with the heart of gold. Mm-hmm. She, you know, it's very interesting. She's you know, she's just trying to make it. She 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 is an innocent, despite the fact that she has sex for money. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. she is an absolute innocent. She believes the things that people tell. She doesn't think there could be a conspiracy. You know, she 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 wants to work in the movies and do makeup. You know, she she has dreams. She she's part of the American dream. I think she's part of the sort of gullible, silent majority. You know, yeah. Like so, you know, people like the, the, you know, why do people vote against their self-interest? Like, why don't you want the taxes to be raised on the richest people in this country who make so much money and own like 98 percent of the wealth? Well, because you think one day you're going to be one of those people because you mm-hmm. believe in the American dream because you work hard every day because you save your money because you do the things that you think are going to do to put you in that class and you don't want to see that class punished for succeeding and she is that person she's that person who who, who is trying to make it she, she's trying to she believes in the american dream and she believes she can work in the movie she, she is despite the fact that she's a prostitute and i know that sounds strange yeah. but she is complete innocence and so when she is killed in front of the american flag it it it, 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 it it's the american sense of innocence being murdered in the film, yeah. that, that I mean, that's really my belief. Is that I mean, she is such a sweet person in that film. Um, I think so too. And, and you yeah. say she she has the the kind of blind optimism. She right. she she wants she wants to live in that fantasy. Yeah. And and Travolta's character is going after uh, going after the truth. He he wants to to 
expose the underbelly in a way. Right. And he he's haunted by it uh, right. by the end of the film. I mean, she's murdered, and he's probably eternally haunted by what he knows and what he's seen and heard. Right. Who, who's better off? <laughs> well, exactly. And, and you know, and I, and I think the Jack character, the, the John Travolta character, I think that he represents the final death now of political activism in the country. Because if, if you look mm. into his background in the film, he worked on something called the Kane Commission, and it ended very badly for him. That was his previous foray into politics. He was very disillusioned by how that turned out. Yeah. Um, and then when he comes into this again and interfaces with politics again, he thinks he can change it, he can expose it, he can get the truth out. And what happens is this lovely, sweet woman dies, and, you know... What dies with him is the belief that he can make a difference, that he can change. And I think that's the death of the of the 1960s counterculture right there. And his agreement, his his really strange act of putting her scream into the film, is almost like he's buying into the yuppie dream at that point. He's saying, you know, I'm, I'm going to trade in the activism for stock options in the corner office because I can't change anything. Yeah. You know, yeah. how the how the how the the hippie county cult, hippie counterculture generation became the yuppies. You know, you know, it, it, that transition is embodied perfectly in um in Blowout, I think, and, and, you know, in his character. You know, he's twi- he, he he thinks he can change things like the hippies did and twice he can't. And so what does he do? I I I'm into the I'm into the lousy grade Z horror movie. Here's your scream. <laughs> That sound authentic enough for you? He's not thinking mm. about her. He, he is haunted. He's dead inside. I, I think it's more than that. He's haunted. He's, he's actually dead inside. He's actually like he's resigned. Well, I guess I'm going to be a part of this system now, you know. Yeah. And, and the inclusion of that scream and that lousy, cynical, uh, you know, the lacking in human dimension <laughs> horror film, you know, is it, it, his final act of resignation. You know, that's yeah. all it is. You know, that's all it is. It's just it's, God. What a great, what a great movie. <laughs> it, it is, it, it, you know, and it, it's a fantastic movie. And, and you know, I think the the critical and popular consensus is that it is De Palma's best movie. But it, you know, it was a box office bust. But you know, probably because again, you know, the, you, people don't want to hear negative things. You know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, that's our conversation about Blowout with John Kenneth Muir. Uh, <clears throat> yeah. How do you? I, that? Uh, how, do you <laughs> how do you what? How do you top that? that was great. <laughs> His analysis of these films is just brilliant. Um, yeah. I mean, I particularly enjoyed examining Blowout and, and Raising Cain with him. Oh, I can't wait to hear Raising Cain. Oh, my God. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's also there's also this uh, in rereading John's review of Blowout tonight um, because, the, again – we talked to Nancy Allen about the misogyny aspect Mm -hmm. and she wasn't shy about saying that she, that yeah, she found his his movies. I would imagine the movies that she's involved with too, um, misogynistic a bit, Mm -hmm. um, which surprised us, but we've always defended him against that. But John had a, a a nice, uh, uh, place here in his review. In, indeed, this is um, with the with the Nancy Allen character and how she's kind of put up as a as bait for the killer, so Jack can nab the killer. How she's kind of baited uh, into becoming part of the conspiracy to begin with, with the governor. Mm-hmm. This is where some critics detect misogyny on De Palma's part. But I see this as the director's commentary on misogyny. Mm-hmm. Sally is brutally used by one political side – to discredit a good man, she is then used by the opposition, Jack, to get to get at the truth. After she ends up dead, she is finally used again, this time by the media, her perfect scream, 
the scream at her moment of death, gets exploited by filmmakers to be enjoyed in a bad slasher film. This is a comment on exploiting women in the culture, but it isn't De Palma who is doing this exploiting. Right. And, and that's... That's a, point. that's a really good point. Yeah. And that's a, that's something that people... A lot of people can't detect. That, that's a delineation that people can't really register, I find. It, well, is that... But it also goes, I think, we may have said this last night or night before, when you do bring that up to people, you bring up a very specific point, a very deep point, people are like, well, hey, it's a movie. It's not supposed to be that deep, you know? Right. Um, you get that a lot. Um, one of the reasons I hate water cooler conversation, because it brings up this, is the stupidity of the American public. But um, you get that. I get that from time to time. not just talking about these would things. You, would you ban all water coolers? Would that take I, care of that? I would. I would. I would. I would ban. I would have an IQ test at the, the water so, cooler. <laughs> so automatically, if we ban water coolers, all all of that will go away. I no, think no. That, that's brilliant. No, no, no. But you know what I mean. It's just that you get. I know that you and Chris have gotten this in the past. Well, that's just too deep. It's not. There's no. It's a movie. It's not. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, I can't tell you how many times a week I, I get that. Um, yeah, it's ridiculous. Um, but he brings up great points, and they're very, you know, they're right there. If you dig a little, you dig a little, it's there. Um, but it's an interesting conundrum, mm -hmm. because the same kind of thinking applies to somebody like Oliver Stone. As soon as I read this paragraph in John's review, I thought about Natural Born Killers. Everybody accused Oliver Stone of, of uh, you know, flagrantly, flagrant, flagrant offense. Mm -hmm. That he was he was he was feeding that kind of culture that kind of maniacal culture. Oliver Stone's argument was no, I'm commenting on it in a satirical way. Mm -hmm. That's a that's a fine line, and I don't I don't know exactly how you define how, how you distinguish between a commentary mm -hmm. or or being a part of it. I, I, you know, I can recognize it. I don't know if I can define it. Yeah, I mean, I know some of the reviews went after um for him because they also, you know, a lot of the conser you know, the conservative critics who would embrace World Trade Center a decade later, um were the same ones that like he, he went after him for, you know, exploiting violence um and you know, they use the example well, he wrote Scarface, you know, and that sort of thing. So, I don't yeah. know, and Natural Born Killers is such a tricky one because um I mean, it's taken. I've only seen it a couple of times. It's not my favorite movie. I won't lie to you. It's not one of no, my not, not, uh, no, nor is it mine. Yeah, and, and I got not because and, and I, it's just regardless I, of Tarantino. And I've read the original script, the Tarantino's original script, and that, that the focus is on Robert Downey Jr.'s character. That's the big difference. I'm actually the book about the making of that movie is fascinating, but um, that's a, it's a good film to bring up. Um, I mean, it's. It's it is blowout is commenta commentating on m many things, mm -hmm. um, but what makes it uh, not an exploitation of of those themes? What what I mean, it's about exploitation. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know? no, it is. It's about those. Things. How can you comment on it without indulging in it? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, that's, that's interesting. That's the point. It depends on the view, on the viewer, the point of view. I guess it's one of these things you you bring you bring into it. You know what you have. You know you bring your own baggage to that. It's like I guess any any piece of art, and um, you just do that. Um, and it well, really is. I, a, I don't know I, how. You, it's a good point. I don't know how you do it, but it's just going to be. It depends on who you are. I mean, I I guess we've got our next conversation with John all lined up. <laughs> yeah, I do. I do. I mean. Cause, I, you know, I was thinking about that tonight. It's, it's, I mean, it's the artist's sensibility mm -hmm. that that distinguishes it. Right. Um, and I don't know. I don't know. It's like who said that Jesse Helms uh, when he said, uh, "I can't, I can't define it." Uh, you know what? What's offensive? Mm -hmm. But uh, I know I it when I see it. Before. Yeah. Um, Somebody like that. I mean, one of those old ninety-year-old. The old, the old conservative guard. <laughs> the old yeah. guard. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. Anyway, uh, so so thank you, John. That's a great great analysis of blowout. Um, now we go to George Lido, who we had great fun with last night talking about Dress to Kill and Obsession. Uh, he's a just a tremendous producer. 
uh, and a great guy. Uh, tonight we talked to him, of course, about Blowout. He has some interesting stories about how that project developed and its reception when it was released. And he tells us a little bit about some future projects that he's involved in that are really, uh, really interesting. So here is George Leto talking to us about Blowout. Blowout is actually one of my all-time favorite films. Uh, I appreciate well, it so, so much. I'm thrilled and, to hear that because before, after Dress to Kill, Brian said, we got to make another picture. Guy. I said, absolutely. And he said, what are we going to do? And he gave me you know, quite a few scripts and books. What do you think? What do you think? Then one day he handed me, like I, I think it was like a seven, eight page outline mm-hmm. uh, of a movie called Personal Effects. Right? He said, why don't you read this, George? So I, you know, this is the thing I've worked on, and, and I think it's interesting, and I read it. And it was only like six, seven, eight pages maybe about the sound man, you know, who over, you know witnesses a crime. Mm-hmm. Right? He said, what do you think? I said, this is our next movie. He said, George, I don't want to have to write a screenplay. Now, i got all these other projects. Let's pick one of these other projects. I said, no, no, this is our next movie. This will be great. I said, of course, I want the girl to live. <laughs> <laughs> Brian says, I don't know. I said, no, Brian, she's got to live. He said, well, maybe, you know. And I, I said, but you got, he said, i got to write a screenplay. I don't want to write another screenplay. I just wrote Dress to Kill. I said, you got to write another screenplay. So he says, God, I don't know, George. I don't want to do it. I said, I'll make you a bet. What's the bet? He's, I said, how much do you think we need for this movie? He said, come on, that's your business. You tell me. Ten million dollars, I said. We'll make the movie very well. Right. Where are you going to get ten million dollars with no screenplay? I said, that's the bet. If I get a commitment to make the movie... On this eight pages for ten million dollars, you're committed to make the movie, correct? And then mm-hmm. you'll write the screenplay. He said, "You can't do that." I said, "That's the bet." <laughs> 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 well, I got it. <laughs> <laughs> I got <laughs> Silway's Pictures, who was taken over AIP. Then they right. wanted to have another De Palma picture. I said, read this out. Said, oh, it's great, George. We'd love to read the screenplay. I said, you can if you commit to the movie. They said, what? <laughs> <laughs> and I knew the people, and I talked them into it because they wanted to stay with Brian to do another picture. That's yeah. mainly. And then when Travolta came on, it became a much more expensive picture. It 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 went up from ten million dollars when Travolta. Well, came. to like sixteen. And maybe yeah. quite a couple million over budget because we had some unavoidable problems. Like the lake that the car was going to go into, mm-hmm. you know, the water wasn't high enough. So we thought, you know, we'd just dam it and the water would be higher. Well, the dam collapsed every time we tried to dam it. Mm-hmm. And they said, well, we'll just excavate some water so the car will sink in and it'll be underwater. We found out there was granite there. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we finally got it done, but that was a big problem. <laughs> Well, that's making uh, movies. You never know what's going to happen to you. That's right. Uh, now, in, ta- in examining uh, Blowout, we've we've had uh, we've had a critic that we we're bringing onto this series, and and his point about Blowout and all of De Palma's films actually is that they can easily be enjoyed uh, as as really effective thrillers, films of that genre. But it, it's also, if you want to delve a little deeper into it, consider the time in which it was made, the politics of the time, and you see the statement that these movies, particularly Blowout, mm-hmm. has to say about the political situation. Oh, absolutely. Uh, no, that's in the that's early what movie. I meant when I said, you know, his his movies, not just the incest, not just the sex change, you know, his mm-hmm. movies encompass, you know, the social fabric of the time. Yeah, you know, that's exactly what it meant. And blow out on the political side. Obviously, it's a Chappaquiddick, you know, theme mm-hmm. there. You know, and uh, and and you know the you know the the sex change and for um, for um, address to kill and for obsession, the underlying incest theme. Right. You know, so they all have strong strong social themes underneath uh, what we hope will be an exciting, gripping, you know. Uh, Riveting, you know, cinematic experience. With uh, with Blowout, it was kind of the opposite of Dress to Kill in terms of 
its initial reception, wasn't it? It, it had the difficulty finding an audience? Um, I think, uh, yeah, it, it, the, the audience was, uh, was not as receptive. And I, I've always said about distributing pictures, the audience will go see the best picture available. And at the mm-hmm. time, don't ask me to list all the pictures now, but there were several very successful pictures coming out at that time that Blowout did. And I think, you know, and even though I became chairman of the company, which is a whole other story because the company was in bad shape and the banks got me to take over the company, the, the marketing campaign my guys came up with was a mistake. It wasn't good. You know, I had the, the poster with John Travolta, you know, uh, and face against black was not, I think, the best choice because John Travolta would have been the reason if he were presented more as John Travolta that the audience would have gone to see the picture. But mm-hmm. John liked that and other things related to it didn't help it. So so blowout, while it was received very well in, in Europe and other places, and eventually, you know, audiences have learned to admire it and it's, it's remembered very well as an outstanding picture. Did yeah. not do as well as we hoped when it was initially released. Well, I I I feel that it's his masterpiece, and and uh, I know many many people that feel that way. So as the years have gone by, do you sense the the growing appreciation of of that film? Well, there's no question about it. I mean, I hear yeah. it all the time that you know we we have we, listen. There's no way to make a film when when certain things don't work and not feel disappointed. Mm-hmm. And I always felt a little disappointed. I, and I always thought my marketing guys, you know, should have been had a stronger point of view and a better point of view on how to sell the picture, you know. But putting that aside, you always feel like, you know, the picture deserved a better faith, and it's a disappointment. And uh, so, yeah, I, I I agree with everything you said, you know. Well, I think it's the greatest uh, the greatest compliment to uh, to a filmmaker, uh, including yourself, that your picture, <laughs> excuse me, your pictures live; they survive. Well, I've been fortunate that way. I, I was recently honored at the uh, Lincoln Center on, for Over the Edge as the greatest teenage uh, the rebellion picture ever made. Quoting yeah. some of the writers from Vanity Fair and Thieves Like Us, Altman's picture, which was my first picture. You know, yeah. they, Paul and Kale called the masterpiece. You know, and the, and neither one of these pictures initially got, you know, uh, what you would call winning reception, mm-hmm. right? Uh, and they live, uh, you know, forever, kind of. Absolutely. You know? So, yeah, that is, I, look, no, but no question, I, you know, when they asked me, because I financed Over the Edge, too, and I had money in uh, fees like us, you know, I keep making that crazy mistake using my own money. <laughs> uh, they said, you sorry you made the pictures? I said, no, it's something I'm proud of. I'm proud yeah. that we were able to make outstanding movies, and I'm grateful to all the people involved in all the movies, you know, because all of this made my life more interesting for me, mm-hmm. you know, and that's what I care about the most. I'm willing well, to do almost anything as long as I'm not bored to death. Exactly, and I just, as a as a big fan of movies, obviously, uh, I just want to thank you because these these films have meant a lot to me in my life. And uh, I, I'm so I'm so honored to have the opportunity to talk to you about them. Uh, oh, bef- thank you. But before I let you go, could you tell me what's upcoming for you? You you have several projects in development right now, don't yeah, you? Yeah, I'm I'm trying to do again some. You know, I I took a rest for a while. I was going to do um, Hawaii Five O, which you know I co-owned with the estate, and and was going to do it with Warner Brothers, and uh, but the scripts never worked out. Mm-hmm. And uh, CBS had the right to continue to do a television series, so they're doing a TV series now. So I, that's on a back burner until we see how the season, whether the series continues, because we don't want to come out with the film while there's a new series on. Mm-hmm. So we're waiting for that to do what it's going to do. Uh, but I have a project now that <clears throat> I developed with my daughter, who's also an outstanding writer and will be a future filmmaker, I believe. Mm-hmm. My daughter, Andrea. And we found these new writers, uh, Tiana, uh, Chris, and uh, Trent, uh, excuse me for a second. <clears throat> uh, we found a script called Guns and Saris by Tiana Langham and Chris Bassunium, the two young writer filmmakers 
who won several awards for his short films in Cannes in, in and various other places, Babaska. I, mm-hmm. I think they have a great future. I love working with people who are coming up. There's a, there's an excitement excitement in that that goes beyond just making the picture. Uh, and and this is a picture called Guns and Sarahs, which has to do with women's rights and untouchables in India. Mm-hmm. And uh, and and I and it's uh, you know it's a very it's a very serious picture about how the women in the villages who are oppressed by the community and the system and and their families are you you know learn get guns learn to shoot them never to mm-hmm. kill or injure anybody but to protect their home and their families mm-hmm. and it's a tremendous story and it's based on some real life incidents that occurred in India and uh, so I'm excited about that and. I think we've arranged the financing for it, and and soon we're going to go out to try to cast it and, and get it going this fall, maybe or next spring. That's that sounds thing. fantastic. Yeah, I, I'm really excited about this because people say, "How are you going to make money with that?" I said, "I don't know. Maybe we'll figure it out." <laughs> well, you, it starts with making something you believe in, I, I think, and 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 your career is defined by that. I mean, these are great films that you've been behind. Well, but you know, there's there's something about Doing something you not only believe in, but you think is a great story. Mm-hmm. You know, I believe in stories, you know, and 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 the films I've gotten in, I, I think all have very good stories. We have strong char- stories and characters and and important themes, even if they're you know the undercurrent of the theme, you know. Yes. Yeah. We don't want them to be like political tracks or whatever. Like we don't want to preach to the audience, but. Hopefully there's a there's a there's a story and a theme and a, and maybe even a morality to it, you know. Right. Right. Uh, that that's what appeals to me and and the, the subject of women and untouchables in India is is uh, is, is uh, and the and the hero, her, heroics of these women, you know, is is a very thrilling, yeah, you know, a thrilling thrilling. I think will be thrilling for people to watch, no matter where they come from and. And also, my daughter has written two original screenplays. One of them is called How Little We Know, which is, a, and she specialized basically in, in romantic comedy. And mm-hmm. I'm trying to get that cast and financed, because I think she'll be an outstanding filmmaker. She's, she's written a, and directed a short film, which I think is very good. And, and, uh, and that's, that's what I spend my life doing, those few things that I like. <clears throat> and quietly, I'm a, I, I grew up in music, and I spent a lot of my time writing music again, which I abandoned for 40 years. Right? Wow. Cause years ago, I wrote a song that Louis Armstrong recorded. And oh. so now I'm putting all my music together and working with some arrangers, and, and I'm going to do some records and have some fun writing and producing music. It sounds, like a, it sounds like a really fantastic time right now for you. Yeah, well, I'm having, great, I'm having fun. Yeah. You know? I, I wish we had uh, made Hawaii Five O because I'd have a lot more money to lose on the <laughs> 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 Well, that that might that might just still come to fruition. I I think this I think the TV show will probably be a big success. Well, uh, we'll so. take the money. <laughs> we, get, we get paid if it's successful. That'll be fine. <laughs> Have you had, 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 I really was excited about making the movie, so I hope we'll get to make it. I hope it happens for you. Have you kept in contact with De Palma at all during the years? Yeah, yeah from time to time. But Brian, Brian, Brian went off on it, on his own thing, you know, and uh, and I kind of go my own way. And and mm-hmm. I think somewhere along the line, you know, we will do another picture. It, that may not, you know, it's it's not it, it's not on the agenda right now. But I respect and admire Brian, and I somehow think that uh, we've tried on a couple of occasions, but the projects never never came together properly. Mm-hmm. But I still think I'm still here, and he's still there in New York, and I'm in L.A. And you know, and I I look forward to one day making another picture with him. Okay, George Leto, uh, talking about Blowout and other projects. He's great. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, um, Dean in our chat room says he, he needs to get an Irving Thalberg award. Yeah, that, that's that's true. It won't be telecast anymore, but uh, <laughs> <you know. laughs> yeah, um, 
He's right. But he's good. I like him. I like his attitude. It's very infectious. Very infectious attitude. Right. Right. And we, we we'd be thrilled to welcome him back on the show anytime, anytime he wants. Um, there's a there's been a couple of uh, questions about input from listeners as part of this series. As as kind of free floating as some of these shows seem to be this week, uh, they're actually quite structured, and that's why we haven't accepted uh, listener calls yet. But tomorrow night, the final night of the series, the final hour. Uh, we will accept uh, listener phone calls. You can share your thoughts on any of the films that we've discussed during the series, your thoughts on De Palma in general. Um, so that's it has the to be time. About De Palma. It has to be about De Palma related. So. Yeah, yeah. Don't call us and talk to us about a foot fungus. <laughs> <laughs> no, we don't want to hear about Resident Evil. You can save that for next week, or, you know, that's fine. Right. But, you know, we right. want to hear strictly about your thoughts on Brian De Palma, the films we've, thought, we've discussed, and maybe there was a film that maybe you thought we should have discussed. Yeah, yeah. And we'd love to hear that, too. Um, like 22, 20, 20, almost two dozen films in his resume. Yeah, so we'd so love I'm to hear sure, that, too. Um, we, might, we might have missed something here. So, um, And, uh, of course, we'll be back Sunday night with Nicholas Meyer, uh, director of Star Trek Two and Star Trek Six, and, and all the latest movie news and, and your phone calls then as well. Um, now we've heard about how the movie came together. Mm-hmm. Uh, let's hear from uh, a little snippet from Vilmer Sigmund, who we interviewed mm-hmm. uh, months back in relation to a documentary that was made about him called uh, Laszlo, uh, Laszlo and Vilmos. That's right. Um, about the really close relationship he had with fellow cinematographer uh, Laszlo Kovacs. Which, ironically, doing research on Blowout, I mean, they helped each other out a, a, a lot. Right. They were they were true friends, and they had to they they lost a lot of film on Blowout, of a climactic scene, I believe, and uh, they had to reshoot, <clears throat> and Vilmos was unavailable. He was, of course, the DP of Blowout, one of the most distinguished careers in the history of cinematography Vilmos has had. Mm-hmm. Um, and so they couldn't get Vilmos back, so they got Laszlo to shoot the reshoots, ironically enough. Wow. Uh, so here, here's a little snippet of what, uh, what uh, Vilmos had to say about working with Brian De Palma. Vilmos, you've worked with some of our great visual storytellers of, of the latter half of the 20th century, one of which is Brian De Palma, and another of our favorite movies is Blowout, which, of course, you shot. What can you tell us about his his approach as a visual storyteller. You know, he he usually it, it does does his homework, and then the yeah. opposite to Altman, you know, he 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 knows ahead what he wants to do, and he in those days actually he did many sketches and showed me the sketches which I could hardly understand understand them because they were like you know like little lines, you know, the people were just you know like. Like one vertical line and maybe maybe a circle like like a head, and then you know I could not read too much of that. The only thing that I could read from those sketches that he wants a medium, or he wants a medium shot here, and he wants a close up here, or he wants mm-hmm. a long, he wants a long shot here. So that was he, he basically for himself, you know, it was almost like uh, making a shot list for himself. Right. And then he he knew exactly what what he wanted to get. Mm. And all I had to do really is just to to get the lighting, set the lighting and composition, which he let me do that. But he was it was very very easy to work with him because he didn't want to do my job. You know, some directors meddling in too much, you know, of of setting the camera or, or, or even lighting, you know. Mm. And he was he was very 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 good at that to 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 let everybody do. The actors can do their job. I can do my job. And we usually ended up with uh, pretty good movies like uh, Obsession and Blowout. Yeah. Obsession yeah, is one of my all-time favorite De Palma films and probably one of my all-time favorite films. And it's yeah. interesting in Blowout, you know, he, he was, uh, as an artist also, he was very strong about his ideas. And, uh, and uh, he had a little um, argument, you know, with the producer about the ending of Blowout. Mm. And um, the producer said, listen, if uh, if uh, the woman doesn't die at the end, I can sell this movie, you know, ten times more than and now that, that you want him to die at the end, you know? <laughs> so well, yeah. He wanted, 
the trouble that the Savior on Nancy at the end. Thank goodness, thank goodness he won that argument. Use that line, you know, about the screen, you know, the, but at the end, you know, yes, it's a pretty good screen. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah, that's Vilmos. Also ironic that that he mentioned George Alito. <laughs> and, and I I didn't realize that until I just pulled up that clip earlier today to prepare tonight's show and uh I would have asked uh, George about that. But it's true. I mean blowout I look at blowout as De Palma's tragedy. Mm-hmm. Um you know, and, and it has an ending that befits a tragedy. Yeah, it does. So I'm I'm curious. I mean, would it have been better received with a, an upbeat ending? I, I don't necessarily know that 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 would be the case. You know, mm-hmm. if, if people people uh, want to go see something, uh, I mean, they they go in probably not knowing the ending, right? Uh, not knowing that it's a downer, unless, unless word of mouth plays a factor. Yeah. Right? Um, you know, second and third weekends and that mm-hmm. kind of thing. But this the, this was a different climate. This wasn't. This wasn't the climate of the huge opening weekend like like it is now, no, where everything I mean, rides on that. It's not even a huge opening weekend. It's that Friday. If it doesn't do well Friday, oh, well, forget it. You know? I right. Mean, I mean, we've gone beyond that. I mean, And really you'd also not. be tempted to say, because we had a conversation, uh, I don't know if I kept it in the interview or not, but when we were talking to Mr. Pressman, <clears throat> uh, he talked about shopping sisters around. Not shopping it around, but he releasing it. I think it was either that or Phantom of the Paradise. He was discussing mm-hmm. releasing it city by city, and he nurtured uh, that film uh, mm-hmm. over a long period of time until it got more and more great word of mouth, and it became very popular. Right. That was a period of time in movies where you could do that. The business model allowed for that kind of thing. I'm tempted to say if Blowout was released in the in, in the earlier 70s. I mean, it was released in 81. If it was released in the previous decade and it took that approach, maybe it would have had that success. But that that's really impossible because as we're discussing these De Palma movies, we find that these movies are so much of their time that yeah. Blowout is a movie of that time. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it couldn't have been made as the same film years earlier. Right. You know? No, you're right. you're absolutely right. Um, yeah, I don't I don't know how it would have. Um, hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I kind of it's kind of a romantic idea now that you can take your film cans and you can go from theater to theater and you know get more and more people attentive to your movie and travel the country with it. I mean, we've got film festivals now that mm-hmm. serve that function to to a certain extent. Yeah. We have so many film festivals now. Um, yeah, we have, yeah. Know, but that, no, but that's good, though, because it's just more avenues. Like what I say about television, there are more avenues to try to get a show onto a, a, cha- a, a network or whatever, a, a cable channel or whatever. And I think it's great that there are so many film festivals because it just gives filmmakers so many outlets that they can attempt to get the film to. So I think that's wonderful. Yeah. I hate, I hate to have to cover all of them, though, but, <laughs> you know, but... <laughs> Uh, okay, so let's get to Nancy Allen. Nancy joined us last night and the night before we discussed Carrie mm-hmm. and Dress to Kill with her. Tonight she's going to be talking to us about Blowout and how she uh, created this character, how it came about for her. Uh, it's, it's interesting, the, the, the thoughts that went into the character. We, a really interesting part of it for me is the voice mm-hmm. that she gives the character. Um, and then she 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 gives us some insights about what it was like to work on the three RoboCop films. Yes, she does. <laughs> to close to close the interview, and that's a great great conversation that ensues there. Here is our last part of our Nancy Allen uh, interview uh, concerning Blowout. Well, another actor that that uh, you seem to have had a great rapport with. I mean, first you worked with him in in, in Carrie, and then mm-hmm. Blowout was Mr. Travolta, and yeah. he he was on the verge of stardom. He was already popular, but on the verge of stardom and carry, and by the time he got to blow out, he was a major uh, superstar. How, how did – how? tell me about that chemistry and how that dynamic changed between those two projects, between the two of you. Well, we did have remarkable chemistry. There's no doubt about it. It was just like a great acting chemistry. I mean, it just mm-hmm. a, lot of, a lot of interplay and, and playfulness between us. And um, 
I literally watched him become a star in Carrie because in the beginning of the film we were in one place, and by the end of the film on location they had to put up barricades. And uh, so those years passed, you know, uh, Saturday Night Fever and Grease, and and, uh, when he came, I remember being at home. The first rehearsal we were just going to have lunch and then do a little improv work at uh, at our place in New York, and uh, I was I was nervous because I said, oh my God, he's going to be different, he's going to be changed, you know, and he, within, you know, two minutes, oh, it was John, and it was just the same, and he was great, and we were working, and it was, you know, it's just a magical chemistry. Huh? You want some coffee? Hmm. Good morning. Hi, how you doing? I'm fine, how are you? Pretty good. Mm. What are you doing here? You, you listen to some music? Nope. This is my uh, this is my job. I do sound effects for movies. Oh, movies, huh? Matter of fact, last night I was I was out recording some sound. What do you mean sound you know, effects? Well, you know when you see a movie and you hear a door slam or a bird chirp or wind or whatever, you know, I record those actual sounds and then I put them in a movie and then you see the movie. Oh. Last night. See I, movies? No, just uh. Just bad ones, oh. unfortunately. I really love movies, you know. It's, it's a very interesting subject to me because uh, because I do makeup. Do you? Yeah. You know, right now it's only behind the counter Corvettes, but I just dream about doing makeup for movies. And you had actually not planned to, or was not planned for you to be in Blowout initially. Oh, God, no. And it wasn't written for either anyone like John or I. It had to, it had to be reworked once he was cast. It was really... Um, written as a small movie and uh, not such a big uh, film. And, you know, people like John Hurd, Jimmy Wood, more sort of cerebral kind of that type of actor. And mm-hmm. it was older. You would have imagined the characters older, kind mm-hmm. of a little more kind of been around, been broken down, you know, kind of hopeless, dark, very, a lot darker. So... When John uh, was cast, it really changed the the scope or the face of the film. And in fact, it was great because what he brought was the humanity and the heart to that character, which really wasn't on the page. It wasn't that it didn't that piece wasn't there. Right. At least that's the way it was for me. So and, when you're so this was a case of of with, with improvisation and, and rehearsal and discussing it actually did play a part in, in forming the script, I would I think. I think so. I think it helped uh, Brian in saying that we'd, we'd just try these little improvs and do things, and he was able to rework the script so that it was more crafted for actor, like an actor like him and an actor like me. Mm-hmm. And when you're building your, your character in Blowout Sally, I mean, she's such a... Such a sweet, naive kind of innocent. She seems to want to be in her own kind of fairy tale <laughs> environment in a way. Tell me, tell me about her. <laughs> I love that character. Uh, I really, she is a favorite of mine um, because I didn't want to play her and I didn't like her, so I had a creator mm-hmm. it create mm-hmm. something that I could. You know, you have to like who you're playing and believe in their in their story, so to speak. Um, I don't know what came first with that character. I don't know if I can remember it's whether I thought about, you know, just take the name Sally. I wanted to change, like it was different. It was probably, you know, Brian was always writing Kate or Liz or, you know, those kind of strong. I don't know whether it was that or I started to have this thinking about, like, seeing her almost like a little rag doll. He's red, curly, mm-hmm. kind of floppy. Got a visual of her and... um and thinking about what she was doing, you know, thinking that she's, the people call her a hooker. She really wasn't a hooker. She did certain things to get illicit information and to expose people. That's not mm-hmm. how I saw her. I didn't see her as a hooker. And giving her that hopeful thing of wanting to be <laughs> a makeup artist for movies, right. that's something that came out of improvisation. That didn't exist in the script, and uh, my recollection is that you know, because I, I believe that people have to have hope in their life and something that they're looking forward to, like a goal or something. Otherwise, it's, 
you know, you're done, you know. It's just uh, so the idea that she could be working and have this thing, thinking like, well, yeah, and sometimes it's going to be in a movie and it's going to be, and I'm going to fix people. It's going to be great and I'm going to be yeah. rich and it's going to be fabulous. You know, just to give her that hopefulness. Now, we know she's never going to do it, you know, but she doesn't know that and maybe underneath she does, but she's never going to say that. So, uh, and I think it also helps a character would help her somehow tolerate even the fantasy that she's well, she's doing this and she's she's helping other women. I think people do delude mm-hmm. themselves a little bit to think that this good thing they're doing it really is uh, what's underlying it is a bad motive, or, which is really her greed. She wanted, she needed money, and she was a little desperate, maybe. So she talked herself, let herself be talked into. Uh, doing something not so fabulous. So Anne Roth was helpful also because uh, I think even things like she gave me this one um, uh, accessory, which was the rabbit's foot that I wore around my neck. Uh-huh. I always wore it. It was on a little pink ribbon, and we didn't show it. I don't even know if we showed it or maybe once, or it was always under all my costumes, just, just to, this, that she would always have this thing on for good luck. Things like that, um, I think, all help. The look, um, the goals, uh, those things are help to form the character. Well, you 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 created such a lovely character with her, and she's so uh, she's so kind of in, innocent, and 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 she has these big dreams, and you articulate that in, in so many ways in your performance, even the, even the voice. Uh, that you give her, and it makes it all the more visceral mm-hmm. how she, how she, her ending in the film, how she ends up. Okay. It's, it's, you can feel it. <laughs> it's, it's oh, a, thank you, thank you very much. So the voice it's a lovely is controversial. <laughs> what was it controversial? The voice, uh, poor George Leto. I remember after the first dailies. I think the first thing John and I shot together was the hospital scene. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And John looks a little bit scruffy in that, you might remember, and uh, and you know how I was in that. And I remember him saying to me, um, are you going to be doing that voice for the whole picture? And I said, <laughs> yes, I am. And he was like, I mean, I could see he was kind of grinding his teeth. And then I think, you know, John Travolta, movie star, sexy movie star, <laughs> looking at these dailies of John with the the beard, the growth, and the hair, and he's, I think he was just, poor this guy was just scratching his head. <laughs> but uh, I, I like the voice, because for me, that was, uh, you just reminded me, that was another thing that I was thinking about, was uh, there are women, and I'm sure you know them, and they do kind of, you know, they do kind of, they never really, uh, you know, grow up, and they're kind of staying in that little girl place, so that they mm-hmm. don't really have to take responsibility, and they always, that that's how they get through their and I thought, you know what? This is kind of this is that kind of character. Right. She really stays in this childlike state. She doesn't. She's afraid to grow up. Doctor, how is she? Very lucky. Mild shock, some cuts and bruises. No major injuries. You can I see her? She might be asleep. She's been sedated. I might just say goodbye. Don't stay too long. How you doing? Do you have my purse? No. But I'm, I'm sure the police will find it. I wouldn't worry about it. I know. Where are you going? That's all I know. Wait, wait a minute. I think you better get back to bed, really. I don't think they're finished with you yet. Come on up. Up. Mm-hmm. All right. So how do you feel? You said I, I was lucky. The uh, doctor. Yeah, he should have been there, huh? Thanks for getting me out. Hey, no problem. God, I didn't realize you were this pretty with all that mud all over your face. I don't need the mud. Well, well, don't worry about it. It's fine. It's a hospital. Who are you? I'm Jack Terry. Who are you? I'm Sally. Sally. Nice to meet you, Sally.
so tell me about uh, the reception to Blowout, because uh, I understand that upon first release it wasn't really well-received, or as pop- maybe well-received by some critics, but not as popular as they had hoped. But over the years, have you found that it's gained prominence? Well, I would say that, yeah, first of all, I'll go backwards. I just got back from a film festival in Europe. It's a fantastic, you know, science fiction, fantasy, and mm-hmm. horror. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And blowout in Europe is a phenomenon. I mean, it cool. is. They think that this is one of the greatest movies ever made. I mean, they never stop talking to me about it. I did so many interviews. Um, I still get near letters and material. Yes, blowout has become more appreciated over the years. There's no doubt about it. Uh, why? What happened when it opened? I think a few things. First of all, it never should have opened in the summer. That's the first thing. In those days, that was a fall picture. Mm-hmm. In yeah. fact, there was a discussion, and I know Brian was pushing for it to open in the fall, but they had John Travolta, and they thought they wanted to try and turn it into a summer, you know, big movie, and it was a, it was really, they just sabotaged the film. Mm-hmm. As a studio, from a studio perspective. Now, right. critically, um, there were some great reviews and there were some awful reviews. They mm. were very, you know, very uneven reviews. And um, I would say John pretty much got across the board good reviews. I think people were really excited to see him in a, a good acting piece. Uh, Brian didn't fare as well. And uh, me, they either loved it or hated it. And a few people, there was a critic... <clears throat> Thank God Pauline Kale liked what I did. I would I don't know what I would have done if she didn't. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, as there was a critic in Chicago, I can't think of her name now, and she was in Chicago. I think, it, no, that was Cisco and Ebert. I don't remember where she was. Oh, oh, Detroit. She was a really big critic, and she was like, I was so waiting for her review because she loved my work in Dress to Kill. She loathed <laughs> my performance. Mm. Every, I never forget she wrote, Every time she opens her mouth, it takes a full minute to recover from what she. Oh said. God! And I thought that's what I went. Oh my God! <laughs> and uh, you know, I started reading these. We had stacks of reviews, and finally, Brian said to me, "You know, <laughs> you might want to stop reading those because he says you know the thing with reviews. If you believe the good ones, you gotta believe the bad ones. So just." The performance doesn't change, you know, just, mm-hmm. you know, you'd be happy with it. But it was it was really uh, disappointing, I think, for all of us that it didn't do better because uh, it, it really is a terrific movie. Oh, it's beautiful. I, and actually, it is one of my favorite, and I know Jerry, one of yeah, our favorite it's definitely films one of ever. My, it's, this and Obsession are probably my two all-time favorite De Palma films. I can't decide which some days, but there's, <laughs> it's the cream. It's, this is, but this is the best. I mean, I talk to a lot of people. Um, about the Palma, and this is the one that keeps coming up, um, blowout. Everyone, it's really, everything comes together in that film perfectly. See, that's what I think, because, you know, you have his political themes going way mm-hmm. back to, um, you know, Hi, Mom, and Greeting, yeah. mm-hmm. and, uh, you know, uh, conspiracy and all of that. And, you know, I just, and, uh, yeah, it, uh, I agree with you. I think it's just a perfect movie. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I do think, no, it's not completely perfect. I'll tell you one thing that's wrong with it. The one thing that I still today think is wrong with that movie is you needed a moment. You needed a moment, a little deeper moment between John's character and my character to, I think, really feel the tragedy. Mm-hmm. It, you, know, uh-huh. it's not, it, you didn't have to have them in bed together, but you needed something. That was my feeling. It still works, but it's just a picky part of that I feel. Kind of an intimacy... Right. Something that you really yeah. feel that there's going to be something, not not you know, or there's there's a moment, yeah, just a moment. Yeah. Tell me about uh, moving on b- beyond a little bit. Uh, I just had one question about the RoboCop films. Yeah. Well, first of all, what are you approached about uh, most uh, from the films that you've done in your career when people approach you? What do you mean approach me? I mean, for an interview? do they do they bring up? Blowout? Do they bring up Dress to Kill or RoboCop? What's the most common film that I, they? I think the, the co- most common films are Carrie, Blowout, mm-hmm. and RoboCop. Yeah. Occasionally, and with all the experiments. I like that's Ro- a good one. That's a good one. I like the film. We we watched that a lot on TV growing up. But. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, <laughs> and with RoboCop, um, you did all all three. 
Yes. Tell me about the different dynamics because you're working with three different directors and yet they're similar elements. Were those three uh, completely kind of separate, different experiences for you? Oh, yes, they were. Mm. The first one was, uh, like all great movies, where everything is it's like blowout. You had a perfect, the crew, the cast, the script, the setting, everything. It's like a well-oiled machine. It's all working together, and you can feel it. You sense, you know you're making a really good movie. True of Carrie as well. And with RoboCop, the first day I picked up the script, I thought, well, I'll take a look at this. And I called before I started to call my agent. I said, ah, they're going to change the title, right? <laughs> anyway, I picked the script up, and I couldn't stop reading it. It was a perfect, perfect script. And um, Paul Verhoeven is brilliant. He's a like a mad genius. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, the cast was perfectly cast. Everything about it was a fantastic experience. I loved it my work on that. I love the movie. Um, I think it it's definitely was it's certainly innovative and, you know, smart, funny, great. Uh, the second one was, and I'm going to blank now on his name. Irvin Kirshner? Did he do that? No, 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 no. I wouldn't blank on that. Um, what was the movie? River's Edge? You know the movie River's Edge? No, yes. Tim Hunter. Yes. Tim, okay, he was the original director of the second movie. And he had written a script, which was great, and I agreed to that. And then there was a falling out with the studio. I don't, to this day, really don't know what happened. And he had written a great part for me, and it was it was definitely the next phase of their story. And then Irvin Kirshner came into the picture, and everything started changing. It was a horrible experience. It was the worst experience I've ever had on any movie. He was, um, I'm going to say, conservatively, not very nice to me, to say the least. Mm. Disrespectful, downright cruel. Uh, um, and, and no, I found out later that he didn't like me. He wanted to recast me. Well, you can't recast the sequel, sorry. Um, right. And I think he, I, I'd come in and I'd have literally like a piece of paper that had been torn off a page with a, and then script sort of supervisor says, oh, sorry, this is the rewrite. He just slashed the script to pieces and ruined mm-hmm. it. And mm-hmm. um, I don't like that. I've seen the movie once, and yeah. I'll probably never see it again. Right, yeah, likewise. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Cause other no, people, no, no. Because well, I sort of liked it. I can't imagine. I don't really see what's to like in it. No, it's, no, I have to say something about that because it is something when we went to go see it. Um and there's a, you know, Frank Miller, I think, wrote the script, who was, you know, a great comic book writer and everything. But that movie just didn't, it just didn't feel like the logical sequel. It just felt, you know, it didn't feel like it was a continuation of anything from the first one, really. And it wasn't. And you know what? I felt sorry for Frank because his script and what he tried to do still was destroyed by Kirshner. Mm-hmm. I mean, Kirshner really massacred that film, and I'm surprised that John Davidson let him get away with it, but... Whatever, you know, obviously I'm still not happy about it. I, I was very sad, very saddened. And it was, like I said, the only time I've ever had uh, an experience like that with a director ever. And um, so when it came to the third one, I had received, obviously the the, the RoboCop thing had become a phenomenon. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Obviously I'd gotten a lot of mail. And obviously it was just, it was, you know, it was big. And when they approached me for the third one, I actually had a premonition that they were going to kill me. I just had a, had a feeling, maybe from the <laughs> second one. <laughs> um, anyway, um, I I met with, um, what's his name, the director? Fred? Fred Decker. Decker? Yeah, yeah, Fred Decker. Fred. I met with him, and it was kind of an okay meeting. And, uh, um you know, I had this sense of directors. It's it's kind of like a real intuitive when they're you just can kind of sense when you're in a presence of a great director. Don't ask me how, but mm-hmm. I could tell. And I knew he was just really not a great director, but I felt a certain responsibility to do the movie. I felt a certain sense more to you know whatever fans were there that yeah. were going to sit. Now, when I agreed to it, there wasn't a script. When I agreed to it, they told me what was going to happen with my character. 
Did I think they would turn this into some G-rated film that I don't know what it was supposed to be? I don't really know. No, I didn't know. And uh, did they, they, you know, obviously Peter was not in the movie. They said he wasn't available. He was. Uh, they didn't want to pay him is the truth of it. And um, I felt really sorry for Robert Burke because he had to literally wear the costume that was molded to Peter's body. Mm-hmm. Right. You can imagine that was not very comfortable for him. So it's very disappointing, I think. Should they do sequels? I don't know. Maybe not. Unless uh, I don't even know. If unless they maintain the spirit of what got it there to begin with. Yeah. Uh, yes, like smart. That movie was very smart. It had a yeah. great humor to it. It had a political point of view. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and, um, you know, yeah, they just, yeah. I mean, it's unfortunate. Well, tell me about what you're what you've been up to now and, and lately. Do you still have <clears throat> the same kind of burning passion for acting that you that you used to? You know, I would say probably not. I would I like to. I mean, I just read something this week, and I thought, yeah, you know, I could could maybe go do this, but it's not a movie I'd see, so I'm I'm not even going to go meet the director for it. Um, I've been very involved uh, for the last, now it's almost 10 years, with a cancer support center that Wendy Jo Sperber, who's an actress that I worked with on a couple mm-hmm. of movies, founded, and I got involved really right in the beginning in the fundraising aspect of it. So I'm, that's really what I dedicate myself to these days, and um, I suppose movies will always be my first love, and if something fantastic came along i would do it like i met a director that i thought was amazing on this trip i thought boy and i saw his movie and i loved it i said god i'd love to work with him that got me excited when i Mm -hmm. see something really good that sort of gets me going but most of the time i don't have i don't have the drive i don't have the um i don't have the need it's an identif- to identify who I am and what I what I'm all about to go and do a movie and the business is really changed. Yeah. So um, no, I would say it's not the same for me.